Well, good morning. Uh, my name is John Young. I'm President and Chief Executive Officer of the Hewlett Packard Company, and it's my pleasure to serve as moderator for today's press conference. I'd like to welcome all of you here today and also extend a warm welcome to our international audience, which is viewing this announcement live uh, via satellite in Geneva. Well, this is a first for me and for this industry. Apollo, Digital, Group Bull, IBM, Nixdorf, and Siemens. It's not every day that we find so many heavyweights in the ring at the same time. You might ask yourselves, what's important enough to get this cast of characters together at the same time? Well, there's a simple answer to that question, and it demonstrates quite clearly that the real power in our industry resides not on this stage, but with our customers. We are here today because of a shared commitment to put customer demands for a standard operating environment ahead of our own proprietary interests. To make this rather noble sounding uh, purpose very real, we've all agreed to redefine the rules of the next round of battle. A much more competitive round for each of us, but one where our customers are assured of winning. As a broad base of the international computing industry, then, we're here today to announce a, a whole new approach to computing. Our vision of a new, more level playing field is as broad as our base. To show our commitment, we have founded and funded a new nonprofit organization called the Open Software Foundation with funding in excess of $90 million. The OSF will develop and provide a new software environment that will make it much easier for our customers to mix and match computers and applications from many different sources. This new environment will result from the cooperative efforts of private industry, universities, and many other participants, all under the direction of the OSF. It will include applications interfaces, advanced systems extensions, and a new open operating system using POSIX definitions as a starting point. Now, POSIX, which stands for Portable Operating Systems for Computer Environments, is an operating system standard closely related to the Unix system that specifies how software should be written to run on computers from different vendors. This announcement, we expect, will make computer users around the world very happy. Let me walk you through uh, today's agenda. Jacques Stern is Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Group Bull and Chairman of Honeywell Bull Incorporated. He'll describe some of the user needs to which we're responding. Ken Olson is President of Digital Equipment Corporation. Mr. Olson will describe what we mean by open systems and some of the benefits they provide. John Doyle, Chairman of the Board of the Open Software Foundation, will talk about OSF's goals and plans, and especially the open process, which is unique in the industry. Tom Vanderslice, Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of the Board of Apollo Computer Incorporated, will talk about the support the Foundation will be receiving from industry. And Dr. Klaus Kessler is Executive Vice President, Communications and Information Systems Group at Siemens, and he'll discuss the Open Software Foundation's Research Institute. Klaus Luft is chairman of the executive board for Nixdorf Computer. He'll show us how OSF is truly international. And finally, John Akers, president, CEO, and chairman of the board of IBM, will wrap up with some comments to summarize and put the foundation in perspective. Now, one additional housekeeping issue. I'd like you to hold your questions until uh, we begin our formal Q&A period at the end and that will run until a, an 11 o'clock cutoff time. Also to our photographers, uh, we will make ourselves available to you for a few minutes after the Q&A, so I'd like to ask that there be no photographing during the presentations. And now to begin our program, I'd like to call on uh, Jacques Stern, Chairman and CEO of uh, Group Bull, to talk about that very key starting point in any enterprise, that is, real user needs. Thank you, John. Our customers uh, have uh, many needs, and of course it is uh, 
our responsibility to find the best way to respond to their needs. And uh, today uh, I would like just to highlight four of them, four that we think are important and four needs that show that uh, our market is becoming today mature. First, our customer wants the ability to easily use application software on computers from multiple vendors. They want to be able to migrate their existing applications. They want to be able to select from a wide variety of new applications without being dependent on a particular vendor. No single vendor today can pretend to offer complete solution for every problem. Customers want to be able to mix and match, as John said, their computing resources. It's a fact of life. And to do all that requires consistent interfaces on which application software can be built. What our customer needs is portable software. And the existence of standard application interface, of this consistent interface, running on a variety of computers from a variety of vendors, means that there will be much more application to choose from available on the market. Independent software houses will be encouraged to develop new applications since they can address a much broader marketplace. Second, customers want the ability to integrate and unify their applications and their system in a distributed environment. Distributed environment with different systems from different vendors and systems spread out across the world. This means making it easy for different applications to work on different computers from different vendors in different parts of the world, independently of the geographical location. In computer uh, jargon, we call that interoperability. Interoperability is maybe not the most listener-friendly word, but it is uh, today uh, the technological frontier that uh, this uh, foundation will have to explore. It involves uh, many things, things like uh, com communication standard, a uniform administration management for both system and network, it includes the ability to implement distributed applications to remote access services, uniform protection and validation of distributed information and data through networks. Third, customers want to be able to use the same operating system in many classes, many sizes of computers from their personal workstation to mini computers, large systems to supercomputers. They want to be able to have room to grow. They want to move to more powerful computers with having to discard their existing application. And finally, customers around the world want a voice in the formation of standard. And so do independent software houses or computer vendors. Users and software suppliers want to be able to provide input on their requirement. Users and independent suppliers want their future needs taken into account as research projects are shaped. They want to be able to monitor, 
to have a say in the development of international standards. This uh, open software foundation will address all these needs by specifying a new open application environment. Both the specification and the environment will be open because the openness is today a strong requirement and the process leading to their creation will be also an open process. So what we are doing today, in a way, is announcing a new era of responsiveness and responsibility for the computer industry worldwide. Today, uh, all these needs that we know for a uh, long time are no more dreams. We know their feasibility, and so are our users. And now, here is Ken Olsen, president of Digital, to describe what we mean by open system and uh, what benefits they will provide to our customers. We're very excited about the announcement today. It's the result of a lot of work. The only disappointment we have is that AT&T isn't sitting here with us. We truly look forward to them joining us next time we have a public announcement. What we are, in spite of what you may read, what we are doing here is not in competition with AT&T. We are doing something beyond what AT&T has to offer, and uh, we are complimenting them, and we look forward to uh, working with them in the future. The subject we're talking about today is not Unix. Unix is related and part of it. What we're talking about is what goes beyond Unix and what is, makes possible to do truly transportable software systems. Much of the success of the computer industry today, to date has come about because of the enormous effort in standards. Manufacturers and users have invested a large amount of money, a large amount of manpower, a lot of patience in many standards organizations in many parts of the world. And the success we've had in computers today is, to, to a large degree, the result of all of this work. Most of this is in open standards where everybody ha can take part. The decisions are made democratically, and the results are open to everyone afterward on an equal basis. There are open standards today by the very formal standards groups that cover all sorts of things, from networking and communications, which include the signal levels, the technologies, and the protocols, the graphics, which include the windows and the, the uh, mouses and the keyboards and other devices, the protocols and disciplines necessary to transfer letters and documents and pictures. There are a number of local area network systems. There are um, database standards and standards for access to database. There are proposed standards for security. And there's many standards we've had for tying peripherals to the systems. It is the purpose of the foundation to standardize on a set of these standards so that when software systems are written, they will have a set of standards even outside the software operating system that will make it work. It is not uncommon when asking people about the problems of transferring software for them to say transferring software from one computer to another or even one operating system to another is small compared to the problems involved in all of these other standards. If there's no discipline in these other standards, if they're not defined, it is a uh, frustrating job of making it transportable. The operating system, the computer, and the computer architecture itself 
are traditionally proprietary. They're built together by a manufacturer. The enormous investment in these is justified only by them being proprietary, and they fit together and are often not separable. The languages which the application, in which the applications are written are traditionally open, formal, public, and disciplined and documented and supported by a very formal public group. Theoretically, if the software writer follows the language carefully, and if the people who wrote the operating system followed the rules of the language, applications written in these languages should be transportable between different systems if they all met the rules. However, software writers invariably go beyond the standards of the language and exploit features in the operating system. This means that the applications quickly become not exactly transportable. Now, it is the goal of the foundation to specify the interface standards, those lines between the application and the operating system, so that if people write to this language standards, which are already formal, and follow these standards, which will be specified in detail, in general, the POSEX standards, then most software, or software with very little effort, will be transportable from system to system. Most customers want to buy a whole system from one manufacturer, give him the complete responsibility. They want him to supply everything and guarantee it'll work. For those customers, these standards will be a big advantage because there will be much more software available, readily available to any of these systems, even if they're proprietary, because of the standards. For those customers who want to buy hardware and software from many manufacturers, and they take the responsibility to supervise the hardware and software and make sure that it's tr truly transportable, and to maintain the discipline of the system, the foundation will offer a very formal, very disciplined foundation on which they can build and accomplish this goal. We see that open systems is really a public trust, something that is very important to our society. And the foundation has set about to carry out this trust and to fulfill its obligations. We will now hear from John Doyle, who is chairman of the foundation, part-time, sometimes executive vice president of Hewlett Packard, and for now working largely on the foundation. John. Thank you, Ken. It's very exciting to be here as my first public act on behalf of the foundation, on behalf of its three goals its seven principles, and the seven sponsors whom you see before you. Open systems have captured the imagination of users, of software developers, and of hardware suppliers. Truly open systems require software built with an open decision and development process. The Open Software Foundation was created to meet those essential needs. It is an independent, international foundation created to define specifications, develop, develop leadership software, and promote an open, portable application environment. It will be run by a president and staff, uh, just as a software company would be run. The impetus behind the first discussions leading to the formation of this foundation was widespread and deep concern about the future of open operating systems. But in getting together to explore our options, a bigger idea emerged, as often happens when truly important issues get discussed with great intensity by people with a lot at stake. The bigger idea goes well beyond a common open operating system. Our customer needs also call for a new level of openness and standards for data management, 
applications interface, graphic and user interfaces, and system and network administration. Our efforts will make it easier for users to mix and match computers and software from different vendors. The Open Software Foundation is taking on a challenge that has never been met in the computer industry. The need for a uniform applications environment has become increasingly apparent, and it's something that computer users worldwide are now demanding. The specifications and products developed by the Open Software Foundation will meet all of the needs identified by the earlier speakers. As we look at the commitment to user needs, uh, first uh, we must discuss application portability. Applications written for the OSF applications environment specification can move without modification from one system conforming to the specification to any other conforming to that specification. This will encourage people to write more applications because they have a broader market to address and will enable users to protect their application software investments. Second, the software we develop will make it easier to integrate distributed applications and resources across systems from different vendors worldwide. The information our customers need is increasingly distributed. It is located in different places, on different systems, from different suppliers. And in order to solve the complex tasks they face, users need to assemble the cooperative efforts of as many systems on the network as are needed. These user needs lead us to the technical vision that has referred to earlier as interoperability. This vision includes a common and open operating system, applications interface, data management and networking specification, plus interfaces for proprietary systems. It combines the best of both worlds, a common open applications environment and the capability of adding proprietary systems when those are the best way to address specialized customer needs. Third, the foundation software will run on a wide range of processes, from personal workstations to supercomputers. This will allow users to select a hardware platform that meets their current needs and at the same time know that their applications will run on the more powerful machines that they'll need in the future. Fourth, the Open Software Foundation will live up to its name. What is unique about OSF compared to other approaches is the open and vendor neutral process by which we will pursue our technical vision. It will be truly open. And let me substantiate that by sharing with you the principles that will define that process. OSF will serve as a neutral party in the computer industry competition. Its founders believe that the achievement of an open software platform is a task that is best accomplished by a joint effort. There are seven guiding principles that ensure the foundation's software and decision making will be open. The first three describe the input part of the foundation's process. The foundation will seek the best technologies and ideas from a wide range of sources. Its membership is open to any profit or non-profit organization, no matter in which country that organization exists. All members will be able to provide inputs on their needs, specifications developed, and features in the new software we bring to the computer industry. Second, the foundation will ensure openness by supporting accepted international industry standards. We'll build on existing standards rather than start from scratch. The POSIX definition will be the starting point for the operating system. The broader XOPEN specifications will be used also. As new standards emerge, we will bring our software into conformance. The press kit has a list of the standards that will be supported. It's too long to read here, but I can tell you that it includes standards for operating systems, languages, graphics libraries, user interface, networking services, and database management. If there are no appropriate standards in an area of interest, the foundation will work with the international standards bodies 
to ensure that standards are adopted in a timely manner. Third, we will be working closely with university and industry research organizations worldwide to obtain innovative technologies. And we've established a research institute to fund and oversee research that advances the Foundation's technology. In a few minutes, you'll hear more details of that research institute. In the middle of our list of principles, and also central to this Foundation's distinctiveness, is the decision-making process. This process will be completely visible to Foundation members. They will be regularly informed of our activities. They'll be able to participate in international Foundation forums and at various times during the specification process, we'll poll them on issues under consideration. As specifications evolve, they'll be made available to all members. When those specs have been finalized, they'll be publicly available. And as we turn those ideas into actual offerings, all members will have equal access to OSF's output. The next three principles describe the Foundation's openness in this regard. <clears throat> At various stages of the development process, licensees will have timely access to source code for ease in designing their own applications or porting the OSF system onto their hardware. Next, we will have consistent and straightforward procedures for licensing source code. Non-members may also obtain source code license. The final principle is really the ultimate test of openness. Our offerings will not favor any given hardware architecture, but will be adaptable to many different architectures. These guidelines are the distinctive contribution that OSF will make to the international computer industry. We will create truly open software systems, and now let's move on to what those will include. The Foundation's offerings will be phased in a manner that will give lead time to applications and developers. The first offering, the OSF application environment specification, shown in yellow on this slide, will clearly delineate the software profile. Applications written to conform with this specification will work with all future OSF products. Level zero of the OSF application environment specification is being released today. It includes specifications such as POSIX, the XOpen portability guide, and the XWindow system. Full details are enclosed in your press kit. These are well-accepted standards, and they provide the basis for people who want to code portable applications today. Level one of the OSF application environment specification will expand to such areas as interoperability and user interface. In addition to specifications, OSF will produce an operating system consistent with the level one specifications. Users will find it easy to migrate their applications from many current Unix system-based products. But even prior to the full operating system release, the Foundation will release portions or subsystems of the operating system for our licensees to incorporate with their own offerings. Subsystems that address areas such as interoperability and user interface will be available shortly. All OS OSF software will be hardware independent and vendor neutral. Licensees can adapt it to their own hardware. OSF will provide validation test suites for members or their customers to verify conformance with the Foundation's specifications. There will be a lot more to come beyond the first operating system. Standards will continue to evolve, and members will continue to respond to their changing customer needs and OSF will expand the application environment and software offerings to meet these needs. Members will work closely with us, and our ongoing research will contribute even more to open systems in the future. So the future will be very interesting and very exciting indeed. Now let's hear from Dr. Tom Vanderslice, CEO and Chairman of Apollo, on the funding and support for OSF. Thank you, John. You know, I can almost hear the skeptics among you asking yourself, it's a great idea, but can they pull it off? 
I think that's a reasonable question to which we think we have more than a reasonable answer. This is a very viable international organization. First, it already has more than $90 million in initial funding. And membership fees will provide additional support if it's needed. Fees for profit-making organizations are, for membership are $25,000 annually, and nonprofit organizations may join for $5,000 a year. Yesterday, we sent out hundreds of invitations worldwide to hardware suppliers, software vendors, users, and universities. Membership is open to everyone who is committed to the objectives and goals of OSF. We feel quite confident that we'll get an enthusiastic response because an open software foundation is an idea whose time has come. As a matter of fact, last evening we received a telegram from Philips. Philips has been committed to the Unix world since 1983 and has played a very active role in promoting this software environment in different activities like XOpen. Consequently, we appreciate the initiative of the Open Software Foundation and we have committed ourselves to actively support and sponsor this foundation. Additionally, OSF will receive licensing fees from companies who choose to adopt its software. In short then, we feel quite confident that the foundation has the financial resources it needs to bring fine software offerings to the industry. There's another kind of resource that we expect to have in abundance, and that's the management and technical know-how. We're beginning operations with some experts we borrowed from our sponsoring organizations. And the foundation is hiring right now. You can expect it to attract the best and the brightest because it'll be a very interesting place to work. We're pushing new frontiers for the computing industry and the people who work for the foundation will know that what they do meets the needs of millions of users. Finally, the OSF has access to some assets from its members technological assets. Its foundation will base its development efforts on its own research as well on, as on technologies which will be selected and licensed from member offerings. The foundation is already starting with some developed and partially developed products from the members. The foundation is not starting with a blank piece of paper in an empty room. Technologies which are being considered by the foundation include Siemens OSI protocol support and Apollo's Network Computing System, or NCS, and Bull's Unix-based multiprocessor architectures, and Digital's User Interface Toolkit, and Style Guides for the X-Window System, and Nixdorf's Relational Database Technology, and Hewlett-Packard's National Language Support, or NLS, and to provide a clear and easy migration path for application developers and end users, the Foundation's system will include features to support current System 5 and Berkeley-based Unix applications. The operating system will use core technology from a future version unannounced of IBM's AIX as a developmental base. To summarize, there's a tremendous need in the industry, and the Software Foundation has the resources and the commitment to meet it. We have adequate funding, good initial staffing, and base technologies from the contributing companies. These are essential ingredients for any successful startup. So today, we think you're looking at the launching of a winner. And now, Klaus Kessler will share with you some information on our research institute. Thank you, Tom. University research has always played a key role in the advancement of open system software technology. In the academic environment, the pressures and constraints of the business world do not apply. Researchers can investigate new areas of technology with a truly vendor neutral view. The results have been impressive. Over the years, university contributions have been extensive. Contributions in the same area that OSF will be working, such as MIT's work 
in the area of user interfaces with X windows. Berkeley's contributions of the Berkeley Standard Distribution Advancing Utilities, Tools and Virtual Memory for Unix. The University of Carlsberg's work on OSI and large networks and the University of Wisconsin's communications contributions in the areas of TCP, IP, and OSI, just to name a few. International research that has contributed to the furthering of international standards. OSF also shares the same vendor-neutral approach that allows for unconstrained research. OSF is interested in advancing open systems technologies. OSF wants to gain access to the results of future research as well. OSF has recognized the value of research and is making a strong commitment to its support. The commitment will be in the areas of funding and direction. OSF will sponsor research of open software and technology that contributes to meet the stated goals of the organization. Universities will develop technology that advances the state of the art in open systems. OSF will take advantage of the technology in future offerings. OSF will create a research institute to build relations and interfaces with universities and research organizations worldwide. The institute will be structured by a formation committee consisting of academic and industry research leaders. We are proud to announce that several distinguished individuals have already agreed to join the Research Institute Formation Committee. These first members include Dr. Lynn Conway from the University of Michigan, Professor Michael Dertuzos from MIT, Dean James F. Gibbons from Stanford University. Dr. Jill Khan from Inria Sophia Antipolis. Professor Roger Needham from Cambridge University. Dr. Raj Reddy from Carnegie Mellon University and Professor George Turin from the University of California at Berkeley. All OSF activities are conceived on an international basis and will have worldwide representation. This is just the beginning for OSF. OSF recognizes the need for a strong research involvement from the very start to solve the difficult technical problems of the future. I am sure you'll hear much more about the Research Institute in the near future, but now let's hear from my colleague and friend from Germany, Klaus Luft, will discuss how OSF is an international organization. Thank you. 
By almost any standards, OSF is an unusual startup company because of its unique set of sponsors, its unique outlook, and its substantial funding. Most startups begin operating in one particular place. Right from the start, OSF will be launched worldwide. That's important. In fact, it's an essential ingredient in OSF's success. For one, the computer business today is rapidly growing worldwide business. There is no such thing as a standard, a true standard, which is not an international standard. No open system can be generally described as open if it's not open worldwide. All of the world's major computer vendors are international companies. But more important is the fact that many of our customers operate internationally. And they are on the front line of foes who need information systems with portability, interoperability, and scalability wherever they operate, whatever vendor they choose. OSF's worldwide dimension is likewise a crucial ingredient in the effort to provide the foundation with the best research and development minds, the best technologies available wherever in the world they may exist. And what better way to encourage the development of new and better application software than to ensure developers that their efforts can be quickly and easily used by their customers on a wide range of computer systems. And I think this is really the new dimension which, bring, which OSF brings to the market. Let me just take a minute to review with you why I am convinced that OSF is a profoundly international endeavor. OSF is committed to international standards. OSF's operating system will conform right from the start with specifications defined by XOPEN, the recognized international body established in 1984. For future development in areas where no standards have yet been defined, OSF will work very closely with XOPEN and ISO and other standardizing bodies to advance new standards. And these standards are much more than operating systems. We talk about application environment specifications. And even so, till today, we have standardizing bodies. There was nobody like OSF implementing on a neutral basis standards. And that's the new point of time we have, the starter we have today. OSF is open to sponsors, members worldwide. Today, invitations were sent to prospective sponsors, members around the world. OSF development will be carried out on an international basis. It is OSF's intent to do worldwide development to access the widest possible range of talents and technologies. This will be done in a variety of ways and include research centers in the United States and in Europe. OSF will work closely with universities and research laboratories throughout the world. The advisory committee for the foundation, for the foundation's research institute, will include members from many countries. The OSF management team will be an international team, tapping into the best talent available in the world, providing insight into a wide variety of cultures and customer needs. 
I have tried to demonstrate the fundamentally international nature of OSF. Permit me to close with one last reflection. A worldwide dimension is absolutely necessary if any system is to be accurately described as open. The creation and promotion of a truly open system will help ensure truly open markets. Open markets mean open, vigorous, healthy competition. By the way, competition keeps us young. And this will be a boon to us all. Customers, application developers, and vendors alike. Now let's hear from our last speaker, John Akers, who will put into perspective some of the key points covered this morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I've been looking forward to taking part in today's announcement, and I'd like to try to put in perspective what we've heard this morning. Through the years, the companies in our industry have developed a wealth of unique technologies along with our own architectures and software environments to take advantage of them. Our industry has grown and our companies have prospered because these products satisfy a wide range of customer needs. And we expect they will continue to serve customers well now and into the foreseeable future. But we need to continue to be responsive to many different customer requirements. In particular, those customers currently using systems based on Unix have told us they are looking toward a future where they will have the ability to select from a wide range of application software and to use that application software on a variety of systems from different companies. And the ability to choose hardware and software that meets their needs and solves their problems with the expectation that it will all work together and the ability to choose a software environment that spans a wide range of processors. In short, an open software environment. Each of our companies has had to consider how best to respond to these users. And we have concluded that these customers can be best served if an independent body beholden to no one vendor, but benefiting from the expertise and support of many, and create a common set of specifications for a POSIX and X-Open-based software environment, a standard that makes it possible to develop applications that can run on systems from many different manufacturers. The Open Software Foundation is the result. The foundation will enhance and extend its software through its own efforts and the creative contributions of its members, as well as the academic community as we work toward providing what customers have told us they expect. While the Foundation's offerings will be significant, so is its charter and the process it will follow. In its work, the Foundation will, the foundation will be truly open in its membership in reaching out for input and ideas from all around the world, in its decision-making, in providing equal access to specifications and developments, and in its relationships with standard bodies. Long term, the Foundation's work holds the promise of a completely open software environment with no limits on its creative growth. We believe it will complement the many unique architectures our industry will continue to offer and that customers will be the winners. Will our companies continue to compete with each other of course we will. We are all in a race for customer preference and customer loyalty, and we will all be adding value to differentiate our products. But our customers and the industry can only benefit by the Foundation's work. This is quite an eventful day, and I believe a good one for the customers of our industry and the companies in it. And I thank you for joining us for this beginning. And now I'll return the meeting to John Young, who will moderate the question and answer session. John? Okay, thank you, John. I'm sure with all of the uh, 
information that's been presented that you have some questions you'd like to have answered. And let me just uh, lay out some grand ground rules so uh, we'll all know how it's going to work. We do have two audiences here in New York and in Geneva, and we will entertain uh, questions from both sites on an alternating basis. Now, our panel will consist of the uh, morning speakers as well as the members of the board of directors of the Open Software Foundation who are joining us uh, now. Uh, they are Michael Gutman, Vice President of Apollo Computer, John McGinnis, Vice President of Digital Equipment Corporation, uh, George Lepicard, Director of Systems Architecture Group Bull, uh, Bernhard Wobker, President of Nixdorf uh, Computer Engineering Corporation, Peter Schneider, IBM's Director of Programming, uh, and Henry Krauss, uh, Vice President of Strategic Relations at uh, Digital, who is the interim president of, of OSF, unable to, to join us as Hartwig Rogi uh, from Siemens. Uh, there are microphones uh, here. Please uh, stand, introduce yourself, uh, and direct your, your questions to, to any members of our panel, or uh, we'll assign them ourselves. But to start things off, I'd like to get an answer to one of my questions. I'm sure that's one many of you share from reading the press uh, speculations over the last week. John Doyle, uh, can you respond on how OSF will serve to help the cause of open operating systems as opposed to splintering the industry? Well, John, the, uh, the foundation is an unprecedented concept. And uh, what you've heard this morning describes something that I think has not happened before. As such, it will take some time for people to appreciate and understand uh, the true values and capabilities that it stands for. But it is our belief that the three goals and seven principles that we've adopted, especially the standards-based open and visible development process, will be very attractive and hence will, sense, will serve to converge the industry in time. The commitment of the firms at the table here will help assure that successful outcome. Okay, uh, let's go to Geneva for our first question. Good morning, New York. This is Geneva. Our first question, which we have been collecting from the audience while you have been speaking, is as follows. What will happen to XOpen now that OSF has taken the initiative? I, I think, uh, first of all, uh, we should give a lot of flowers today to XOpen because XOpen opened a lot of communication between our industry for this day. And secondly, I think uh, we need speedy bodies to standardize issues. And therefore, we need the work of XOpen and some other standardizing bodies. And the charter OSF has is really to implement on a neutral basis such kind of standards. So I think there will be a lot of cooperation between the standardizing bodies and OSF. OSF is not a new standard or a new standardizing body. It's a body to implement standards. And that's the big new story here. And I think it will really uh, give a lot of help to the standardizing bodies in the world. OK, let's go to the question over here. Yes, uh, my name is Jeremy Young with Electronics Magazine. And uh, I'm very impressed with the group I see here and uh, represents a lot of horsepower. but. Uh, one's left wondering, where are the real Unix people? Where are the unambiguous uh, Unix vendors and of hardware and software? All of you people, as Vittorio Cassoni would point out, are starting from a proprietary operating system foundation. And some of you, it would be said, have a lot to benefit from the splintering and the confusion that could result from this. Where is computer consoles? Where is Pyramid? Where is Unisoft? Where is uh, Interactive Systems? Where are those guys? Tom, why don't you uh, try that one? Well, all the companies you just mentioned have been invited to join OSF. Uh, speaking for my own company, we are Unix based as well now. That's our 10 release. Uh, HP, for example, is strongly dedicated to, to uh, Unix for the last four years. Uh, this group here is, is starting out to support 
standards in the industry, not just an operating system, but a, but a total system environment. And as Ken mentioned in his talk, just agreeing on an operating system doesn't quite do it for you. There are other things like network interfaces and other things, much more involved, much more complicated. And this, this, form, this group here is working very seriously to develop a true world-class open system environment. Okay. I feel a little hurt having digital being left out of those Unix people. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> After the last year's survey, for 19 years, we've been the largest supplier of software, hardware, and software, system, software and services. Much of the 19 years, we were the only one. Um, so uh, we don't feel like we're outside the Unix community. All right, let's uh, go over here. Uh, I'm Mark Schulman from Solomon Brothers. Great stress has been placed on the international aspect, but I see no representatives of Japanese firms. Have they been contacted? If they have been contacted, what has been their response? Uh, John Doyle, how about uh, responding to that one, please? Uh, we plan on inviting uh, Japanese firms, and we have been in contact uh, with some Japanese firms. This, is, this whole program has happened on a fairly short fuse, and it has not been possible to uh, cover the whole world in, in, uh, in complete depth. Uh, so I will be in Japan uh, a week from today, and we'll expect to be talking to uh, Japanese firms at that time. Thank you. All right, back to Geneva. Hello, this is Geneva. Uh, our second question from our 300 strong press audience here today is as, is as follows and is addressed specifically to Mr. Olson. It is as follows. You were quoted in Business Week, May 16, <laughs> as saying open systems are, quote, snake oil, unquote, and about as, quote, as exciting as a Russian truck. <laughs> How do you reconcile that with your membership in OSF? Uh, don't believe everything you read. <laughs> My comments on snake oil were the comments I could have made today and would have been very fitting. I very carefully phrased my statements. I said that unless you have all the standards necessary specified and followed, you will not have a transportable software system. And as anyone who says just putting Unix on something makes it transportable is snake oil. And so the snake oil story I no longer use because I get misquoted. Uh, I never said Unix was snake oil. And the message then is exactly the message we're presenting today. It takes a lot of standards. Um, the um, exciting is a Russian truck. Um, <laughs> it is, is, is pertinent. I'm not sure it come out right today. <laughs> standards are not exciting. Standards, when we have all the standards lay out, laid out, they will not be exciting. The exciting things will come about when John Young tries to do a better job than digital, and digital tries to do a better job than John Akers, and everybody's doing a better job, and with, then the excitement and the interest comes out. Standards in themselves are like a Russian truck. And we love people to work on standards. We support them and just appreciate them no end, because it takes a lot of patience, a lot of work. It's terribly critical. And uh, it's on that basis that the exciting things done, are, are done. Gracefully done. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> Let's go right here. I'm Dan Rosenbaum from Macintosh Today Magazine. At $90 million of funding, it's plain that the, the players here have donated more than the $25,000 entry fee. Will the voting on the Open Software Foundation be one dollar one vote or one company one vote? John, do you want to respond to that? Well, the, 
the, the structure of the board is such that each uh, of the sponsors has one board member, and we will expect to have board members elected uh, from the membership at large. Uh, we haven't counted the, the votes per dollar, but don't forget that this is simply a board of directors, that the foundation, when fully staffed with president and management team, will have a significant and independent life of its own, and the board will simply be able to have the influence that a board normally has over an ongoing and independent entity. And so the actual voting on the board, I think, uh, is unlikely to be the major factor about the direction of the foundation. Foundation uh, adopts be on a, a vote of the membership or on a vote of the board? We will, the, the, the standards that the foundation adopts will be the normal business of the development team of the foundation. And I don't expect to have to call for a vote on uh, the implementation of a particular minuscule standard from the, uh, from the board membership. <clears throat> That's not the province of the board. Okay, let's, uh, sorry. Mike, did you want to... Uh, Let me help a little bit here. The, uh, the, you asked a very specific question, and the voting rights are one vote per membership fee. If the membership fee is as a member, which is 25000 or 5000 depending on whether you're profit or non-profit, you get one vote. If you are a sponsor and you pay uh, somewhere in the millions of dollars, uh, as sponsors do, in order to ensure success of the organization, then you get one vote. The uh, difference is that the membership will provide the initiatives, uh, the areas to, that the foundation will address, uh, technical inputs, review specifications, users group, all the things you would expect the membership uh, to generate. Uh, and it will be an open process so that all can see uh, uh, what inputs are and what decisions are made. Uh, the board has uh, the very straightforward responsibilities besides the opportunity to, uh, to pay somewhere between one and four and a half million dollars. We have the opportunity to set the policy and the direction of the foundation and to select the president. Then we put in the hands of the president the day-to-day -day operation of the organization. It's an independent company. We expect the president to make the uh, foundation successful. Okay, let's go to uh, this gentleman. John Reimer from Computer Decisions Magazine. Why was AIX chosen as a foundation product, and what will distinguish the future version, uh, the future unannounced version from the current version? Uh, Don, would you like to take that one on, please? Sure. We, we look for a, uh, a, a foundation that had a lot of uh, capabilities for the future, a good foundation that we could add an awful lot of technology to, to look to the needs of users that, that we've already seen addressed in the open systems community. And uh, when you look at the list of technologies that the uh, seven companies have offered to the foundation, it's all in your press kit, uh, there's an awful lot of work to do to select those technologies and build a complete offering in terms of what's going on. In terms of what AIX has, uh, what this future release has, I think that that's probably proprietary information at this point in time over what the present product has, if I'm not correct, Pete. What it has is a set of enhancements that you could expect. Excuse me, uh, I think you're going to have to uh, maybe go to the podium right to, uh, to comment. <clears throat> what we did in the, uh, in the technology that we're transferring is add extensions over the current AIX product release 2 that's out in the marketplace on the RT in key areas of basic structuring of the underlying control program to provide concurrency, recoverable file systems, and technologies uh, such as that. So we believe that that coupled with the modularity of the structure made it attractive uh, to the foundation's objective of merging diverse technologies from all the sponsoring and uh, member organizations. Okay, it's uh, back to Geneva. Our third question from Geneva is as follows. Is OSF open to members of the USSR and the People's Republic of China and if so, with, will those members have access to the results of OSF-sponsored research? 
John? I don't know the specific answer to that question <laughs> in actual fact, but uh, we have not, I think, addressed that in the in the bylaws, but it seems to me that we expect to be a truly international foundation, and so we would expect membership from countries throughout the world. There may be some limitations on that, uh, depending on the uh, particular laws of the country of incorporation, uh, but we will have to see how that evolves. Okay, uh, over here. Yes, this is Don Brown with D.H. Brown Associates, and uh, I'd like to return to the question of management. Uh, achieving consens consensus necessarily takes some time, and I'd like to know how you're going, uh, going to avoid uh, creating a permanent lag in terms of what you offer in the market in dealing with the, the problem of confronting the uh, process of decision making in achieving the consensus. Won't you always lag uh, as you try and work around that consensus in terms of what you offer the public? All right, Tom, would you like to give an answer to that? Sponsors initially will select the members of the board of directors, if you will. And the board, in turn, will hire the chief executive and chief operating officer of the OSF. The board seat will be made available uh, to members at large. However, it won't be a voting process by all members and all decisions. The main function of the board will be to select the right kind of talent to run OSF in accordance with the guiding principles which John Doyle walked through. Once that individual and the chief executive, chief operating officer, whatever, those individuals are selected, the decisions will be made by that just like a company's decisions are made. So it won't be going back to the board to ask, you know, what, what particular standard or nuance of a standard is being selected. There'll be some broad guidelines given to the management, like when you, to, to, to really develop systems which in system environments which are in agreement or conformance with worldwide standards like POSIX and XOPEN and so forth. But this will be an implementing group. It's not a discussion group at all. It's an execution group. Okay, okay let's go over here. Uh, hi, I'm Stu Gaines from Fortune Magazine, and I'm interested in a little bit more of the details of how the group will work. Where, where will it be located? Does the $90 million funding extend over one year or more than one year period of time? And uh, is the $90 million um, going to be used to develop the operating system that you were talking about? And if so, is that enough of a research budget to do the kind of work you're going to do, or is it insufficient? And what does $25,000 mean from a member uh, in terms of the needs of the group to do what it wants to do? John, would you like to take that one on? Well, that, that, that's a lot of questions. Uh, take the easy one first. We have not yet decided uh, where the permanent site for OSF is going to be. We're operating in a temporary location at the moment uh, that we've rented for the next few months. The, the 90 million uh, commitment uh, is uh, for a period of three years. And uh, starting from the base of technology that, uh, that we have, uh, we believe uh, that will be an adequate number, not only to develop uh, the specifications and the software products uh, that we intend to come out with, but also to provide some significant funding for the Research Foundation. The, uh, many of the details of the management of of the foundation, of course, are yet to be fully fleshed out because uh, we do not yet have permanent staff. Uh, but we're busy uh, recruiting right now and expect to have permanent staff before long. Okay, uh, it's back to Geneva. Our fourth question uh, it is directed towards IBM and digital. Uh, the question is as follows. How deep is the commitment of IBM and digital? Will they change priorities as to their proprietary systems, for example, SAA, compared to XOPEN and POSIX? All right, John Akers, maybe we're going to turn to you first. Well, I think that uh, first I ought to perhaps remind the questioner that the IBM company uh, has made a major commitment to uh, 
to standards for a very long time and has specifically made a significant uh, commitment to unit, the Unix environment, having invested in the development of AIX and having announced its availability uh, over our entire product line. Uh, we are totally committed to, uh, to that uh, environment. We are uh, totally committed to this foundation. We're happy to have been asked uh, to join it. And uh, we will continue to invest uh, in, in the opportunities uh, presented uh, by uh, the uh, uh, evolving standards. We will also continue, obviously, to invest uh, heavily in our proprietary uh, uh, offerings as well. Uh, this doesn't, in any, this activity uh, in, uh, in support of OSF in no way uh, diminishes our commitment to our proprietary uh, environments, including and particularly SAA. Uh, Ken Olson, would you like to say something about your position? Yes, our attitude is uh, very close. We um, have supported and, sh and took part in many of the early activities in getting this organization going. Uh, those speeches which I was, I think, misquoted on, I tried hard to say almost what we said today. And some of the reporters took that as being anti-UNIX. It really was, we should complete the standards to make it possible. So we're enthusiastic about it, deeply committed to it. Uh, it's going to be a long time before we can do what we do today with proprietary systems using an, an industry standard. Uh, our support for the proprietary products we have, for the things we're doing today, the things we offer today, there's just no wavering on because it's the only way we can do things that have to be done. Unix was never designed to be a commercial system, never designed to do the broad breadth of things that uh, we are talking about today. It'll be a long time before we're able to offer these things in an industry standard way. So we're committed to both, and there's nothing inconsistent with maintaining both commitments. Okay. John, could I sure. add that? Yeah. One other measurement of the commitment of both IBM and digital is the type of technologies that both companies have offered to the foundation for consideration. It's all in the press kit. Okay. Now. Esther Dyson, Release 10. Can anyone with 13 and a half million become a sponsor? And second, what sort of covenants govern the hiring of employees from your member companies? John, would you like to uh, take that one? or? Well, we, uh, we plan on having uh, an open process for the consideration of new sponsors, and we will expect, uh, I think, to receive considerable uh, number of applications as a result of this announcement. The, uh, the major factor uh, <coughs> behind sponsorship is a firm adherence to the principles of the Open Software Foundation. And uh, perhaps a minor one is the ability to come up with a few million dollars. The, uh, what's the second one? About hiring, covenants about hiring people from the sponsors. Yeah, we will have to uh, pay great attention to the, uh, to the, uh, proper relationships between uh, the foundation and the uh, sponsor companies. Um, we will expect to have appropriate contracts uh, between the foundation and the sponsor companies for the temporary employees that we use from those companies. Now you have to show evidence of your adherence to the principles because I understood from something you said earlier that there were no requirements to actually do anything on the part of member companies? Well, we can't require uh, companies to do something, uh, except, of course, they will have to sign the foundation documents. And they are uh, quite rigorous and exhaustive. And uh, I think signing them will be a, an expression of commitment uh, as a sponsor. Okay, let's go over here. Hi, uh, John Levinson from Goldman Sachs. I, uh, my first question is, when do you expect to be shipping level zero 
And in fact, is there a common release date for all companies, or are some companies going to get a little bit of an edge over others for whatever reasons? The second question is that given release zero is going to be pretty rudimentary relative to what OSF will eventually be, when do you expect to have the operating system with networking, a database system, and a user interface, for example, to be shipping? Is that one year from now, two years from now? Uh, could you give us a, a rough idea of that date? Don McInnes, can we uh, turn to you for that one? Sure. Uh, level zero of the application environment specification, which is in the press kit, lists some 18 specifications, or actually 18 standards. Those 18 standards are all actually consensus body standards. Uh, so we won't actually be shipping any product based on that. It's an endorsement by OSF that this is the application environment that software developers in this market area can program to and be guaranteed that that's the future direction that we'll be behind. It's actually uh, practically identical to the direction that XOpen has identified for their application environment. And we believe from our understanding of what the National Bureau of Standards has said over the last month about their application portability profile, it's also very close to their direction as well. Uh, so it is not actually a product, but it's a whole application environment that, that uh, we could expect ISVs to, to program to. The uh, first product will encompass uh, most of those specifications and will have a number of enhancements in the technology areas that we'll be working in, like interoperability and, and user interface. Can you give us an idea, though, of when that would be shipping? I mean, that was, and also when you expect the, we, uh, the things that most people can we don't care have about. A, we don't have a targeted date for the first major release. Uh, we'd like to think in terms of 18 months, but until we get a full time. Uh, development staff hired and on board, uh, we won't be making those, those commitments. We uh, would actually like to think in terms of some uh, enhancement areas, layered products perhaps, coming out in a much earlier time frame from that list of the 25 technologies offered by the seven sponsoring companies here, and I'm sure that there'll be other members who will offer technology as well that will hopefully allow us to uh, put out uh, release software, additional add-on software that could be put out in an earlier time frame. But once again, we can't make any commitments until uh, the full-time uh, development staff is on board and, and they have plans and programs in place to meet those commitments. Yes. Jacques, would you I, like yes. Yeah. What I, uh, I would like to add is that this OSF uh, development company, because they are starting, are not starting from scratch, as you understand. They are starting with uh, contribution from all uh, the sponsor already. And it does not cover only the core of the system, as you can see from all the contribution. And it will be the responsibility of the management of OSF to look on this contribution. It covers all the grants you just asked for. Data, relational database, communication, uh, distributed system, uh, multiprocessor system. So all the ingredients are there. It will be now a responsibility of a new management to make the best use of all these contributions available in respecting totally the POSIX and NICS open standard, and OSI standard also. Okay. Um, I think one important point we, which we, we just cannot overemphasize here is that the information flow to the members and the sponsors is going to be on as an equal basis as possible. Preliminary source code on, and so forth will be made available. And so it's, it's fundamental that the potential users and software houses and whatnot get early information and get every possible chance to input to the process. It doesn't mean it'll be a big vote among everybody, but basically we're seeking out input from, from the members and for the sponsors in general and basically trying to make information available on the most timely possible basis so that it really truly will be an international, worldwide, open standard. Okay, we have a lot of questions uh, still to go, so let's go to Geneva now. Hello. Uh, this is our last question, I understand, and appropriately it is uh, concerning Europe. And the question is as follows. To what extent will OSF conduct its research in Europe, and will there be a European presence of OSF here? Uh, Dr. Kessler, can we uh, ask you to respond to that, please? Well, as I pointed out, the research activities will be based internationally. We expect um, a lot of important activities in the United States as well as in Europe. 
I feel Europe um, has a very good chance to make important contributions. There will be a liaison office quite soon in Europe from OSF. So besides the research and development work in both sides of the Atlantic, there will be also liaison in uh, Europe. Okay, let's go over here. Susan Breidenbach, Computer Reseller News. You said you were going to build on existing standards whenever possible rather than create new ones. In that context, what about SUNS NFS? And also, um, you said that uh, what you're doing is complementary to what AT&T is doing. I was wondering if somebody could elaborate on how this is in any way complementary to, for example, the development work being done on System 5 Release 4. Uh, Mike? Uh, I didn't hear the first part of the question. Well, SUNS NFS will I think was her question about uh, that wasn't one of the standards that was listed. What, what about NFS? The, um, as you know, the work that we are um, doing or that we're starting on here is from a base of uh, AT&T technology. Uh, and therefore, we will um, expect members and the foundation to uh, license uh, appropriately from AT&T. Uh, the whole position of the foundation in terms of what we'll do is we will um, augment or decrement uh, from whatever technology we, we, we take and make the decisions um, for the industry, by the industry, uh, as to what products we'll put out. Um, taking, uh, and, I, and therefore, I don't think it's appropriate to name any specific uh, technology or implementation that we will or will not uh, uh, embrace at, at this juncture. That will come from the technical team uh, in the very near future. Okay, we have time for just uh, two more questions, one here and one from Geneva, so uh, please go ahead. John Rutledge, Dylan Reed. I have a two-part question concerning funding. In the spirit of openness, can you disclose where the $90 million is going to come from? Is it equally? Uh, supplied by all members, or is, is it lopsided? And secondly, since disputes do occur among uh, members sometimes, uh, is it transferred automatically each year in advance so there won't be a problem? And thirdly, uh, Japanese uh, companies are not represented now. Do you feel an obligation to get a Japanese company on your board of directors? You have three European. John, do you want to take that one on, please, John Doyle? The, uh we do expect uh, to have a Japanese company uh, as a sponsor and, and hence on the board. Uh, we don't know for sure, uh, of course, because uh, we haven't been in adequate discussions with them for them to be able to make a decision. The, uh, the funding uh, is equal from each sponsor. Uh, we think that's necessary to have a completely even-handed uh, direction to the foundation. Uh, and the commitments are made uh, for three years, uh, but it is at the uh, discretion of the board to ask for certain amounts of money to be paid directly into the foundation as appropriate to our needs during that time. Okay, let's go back to Geneva for our final question. Thank you for offering us the very last question of the conference. It is again related to Europe, and it's as follows. How will the OSF initiative help European industry's efforts to compete with U.S. and Japanese-based manufacturers? Jacques Stern, would you like to uh, try that one? Yes, uh, it's a very good question. In I think it has been very clear for the last few years that uh, all the European industry was looking for an open market. And you cannot have an open market if there is no open standard. And uh, the European industry is looking for uh, high competition. We are uh, here for competing on the market and competing with each of our customers. And the best way to compete is to share common standard. Uh. Klaus, would you like to extend those remarks? If I can, I, I think uh, the European companies very much uh, targeted for the users with a lot of solutions. And uh, it's in the best interest of the users and of the European companies 
to have a certain base as a standard so we could even invest more to uh, build solutions for the users. All right, our uh, clock on the wall shows us 11 o'clock. Uh, that ends our uh, question and answer period, but as we uh, promised, the panelists will be here uh, for a uh, uh, photo opportunity for the next five minutes or so. The uh, Open Software Foundation will, board members will remain and we'll have a chance to have one-on-one -on -one, uh, discussions with them. And let me just close then with our, our thanks for joining us on this very historic occasion. Thank you very much. Well, you're either lucky or a great chairman. I think I might